Well, this morning we're continuing in John's Gospel. Um, we're in John chapter 3. Last week we were looking at what Jesus said to Nicodemus regarding the new birth. Uh, this week we're actually going to deal with just um, a few verses, verses 9 through 13. But what I'd like to do is just read a little bit beyond this, verses 9 through 21. And what we want to uh, look at here is the fact that Jesus speaks and we need to listen to him. We need to believe him and we need to act on what he says. So let's pick it up in uh, verse 9 of John chapter 3 and I'll read through verse 21. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel? And do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpents, in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in Him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. He who believes in Him is not judged, he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world. And men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. So in the reading of God's word, again, may he bless this portion of his word to our hearing uh, this morning. Now, I know these are only a few verses, but there is so much in here. I just couldn't really bite off more than this small chunk. But let me just begin by reminding you of what we were looking at last time. We're basically looking at what Jesus had to say about how you can enter into God's kingdom. Now that was Nicodemus's question as he came to Jesus. He recognized as we saw that Jesus was a great teacher. Jesus was sent from God. Even that Jesus was the, the Messiah. If anybody would know the answer to the question of how to enter into God's kingdom, Jesus would know, and as a matter of fact, Jesus did know. But his answer to Nicodemus wasn't the answer that Nicodemus was actually expecting. It wasn't just believe that I'm the Messiah or keep the law and you will be saved. Believe what God says is true, or perhaps the one he was expecting most of all, you're a child of Abraham, Nicodemus, you're in. You see, everything's okay. Now again, knowing what we know of the Pharisees and their understanding of Scripture, this is undoubtedly what Nicodemus was expecting to hear, but that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, no, Nicodemus, you must be born again. You have to be born of water, which, of course, is the natural birth. And in the case of Nicodemus, what he was telling him was, not enough to be a child of Abraham. It's not enough to be a natural descendant. Being born of water isn't enough. No, Nicodemus, you must also be born of the Spirit. You have to experience spiritual rebirth. Now, if, if this hasn't happened to you, if all you have is natural birth, that's not enough. If you haven't been born a second time by the Spirit of God, which you can know by the fact that your life has changed from the inside out. The desires change and so the way you live changes. If you don't see yourself becoming more and more like Jesus Christ because you love Him and because you love His ways, then you have not been saved. You see, you can only be saved by the second birth. Your sins haven't been forgiven. Basically, you're still on your way 
to judgment. Remember what Jesus says. There is only one way to escape, and that is to be born again. And the only way that you can be born again is by coming to Jesus, by asking Jesus to change your heart, to give you the strength to turn away from those sins that you love so much, and to give you the power to trust in Him. There's only one way. Now, this morning we see that even though Jesus said this very clearly, Nicodemus was still struggling to understand what Jesus was saying and to believe what he was saying. Now, if you're having the same problem this morning, you need to understand that this, what Jesus said, was not just taught for the first time by Jesus. This is something that's throughout the Bible. And you need to listen to what it says. And you need to push forward to faith. Now this morning I want us to consider two things. I do want us to consider that the new birth is clearly taught in the Old Testament. So much so that Jesus told Nicodemus you should have already known about this. But I want you to see too that it's even more clearly taught in the New Testament by one who has come down from heaven itself to declare to us the truth of God so that you might be saved. Now first I want us to see the new birth is clearly taught in the Old Testament. Jesus told Nicodemus... He had no excuse for not understanding this teaching, what he was talking about. First of all, look at Nicodemus' response in verse 9. Nicodemus said to Jesus, how can these things be? Well, what things was Nicodemus referring to? The things that Jesus was talking about. That you have to be born again. That you have to be born of water and of the Spirit. That the Spirit's work in giving this blessing is basically a free and sovereign act, just like the blowing of the wind. You can't see where it comes from. You can't see where it's going. But you can see its effects. Its effects are a life devoted to God. Now, Nicodemus should have known this, but somehow Nicodemus missed it. Look at verse 10. Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel? And do not understand these things? Now realize Nicodemus was not an ordinary Jew. And he wasn't even an ordinary Pharisee. He was a teacher. More than that, Jesus says he was the teacher of Israel. Whenever uh, you have in, in the Greek the definite article, it sets something apart. Same thing in English, right? It's not, let's say, a boy, but the boy. You're referring to somebody specific. And that's what we have in this case. Now the Jews had differing levels of instruction, just like we have differing levels of instruction and education. We have preschool, we have elementary school, we have middle school, high school. We have undergraduate and graduate programs, and then, of course, those graduate programs, we have master's, doctorate, and postdoctorate degrees and studies. And we have teachers that teach at every one of these particular levels. Well, the Jews may not have been as diversified as we are. We have a very developed educational system. But they had elementary to advanced studies. Nicodemus was advanced. He wasn't teaching at the local synagogue level. It's not that he didn't teach at the synagogue, but he was, he was higher than that. Sometimes, you know, we have uh, seminary professors come and preach in our churches, which is great. But that's kind of like what Nicodemus would be doing if he spoke in a synagogue. Nicodemus was a doctor of the church. He was a very famous and respected theologian. Again, Jesus refers to him as the teacher of Israel. And yet, in spite of all his learning, he really had no idea what Jesus was talking about. Now, I think that's significant because you can know a lot about the Bible you can understand a great deal of many of the things that it teaches, but you can still miss the most important point, how to enter God's kingdom. Essentially, that's what we need to be reading the Bible to discover, how to be saved. Nicodemus misunderstood how it worked. Now, one question we need to ask ourselves is this, because Jesus is talking about something a lot of people don't understand. Did it really matter that Nicodemus didn't know, you know about this teaching? Well, yes, it, it mattered, but in another sense, it didn't matter. And I do need to clarify that. In one sense, it, it, it didn't matter. It, it's, it's certainly true that you cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you are born again from above. That's true. 
But it's also true that you don't have to understand it in order to experience it. I mean, God can still save you even if you don't understand exactly how He did it. The Spirit of God breathes where He wills. I would imagine that for most of us here this morning, you didn't really understand, you know, how you were saved, how it is you believed when you believed. You just thought you believed. You just thought you heard the gospel and you responded in faith and repentance and that everybody can do that. That's one of the reasons why there's so many in the church today that believe that salvation is purely a matter of choice. You have that ability, you can choose. That anyone can believe at any time. The majority of churches believe that and actually teach that. Well, does that mean they're not saved? No, it doesn't mean that. If they're trusting Jesus, they're saved. They don't have to understand it in order to experience it. But in another sense, it does matter whether you understand this. Because for one thing, you do need to give credit where credit is due, right? I mean, God is the one who did this. He not only sent His Son to save you from your sins, but He sent His Spirit to change your heart and to give you the ability to believe. God did that. You didn't do that. That's what Jesus is talking about here, right? The Spirit breathes where He wills. He did that. You didn't do that. You need to give God glory for that. And unless you understand this, you're not going to give Him glory. The glory that is his due, again, I would remind you, Augustus Toplady and John Wesley. Augustus Toplady was continually criticizing Wesley for his doctrine of, you have the ability, Wesley, you don't have the ability. God gave you that ability, and you're robbing him of his glory. So it is important on on that particular basis, but it's also important so that you, in understanding this, might be able to help those who don't understand and who aren't saved, what they need to do to be saved. This is something, again, that's largely forgotten, perhaps completely unknown in most churches today. Since people don't have the ability to believe, and yet, you know, apart from God's grace, and yet they can be convinced the Bible is true and know that they're on their way to hell, you don't just tell them, here, pray the sinner's prayer. They actually have to love and trust Jesus Christ. They actually have to turn away from their sins and follow Him. And yet, knowing they must do that doesn't give them the ability. So what do you tell a person like that? Well, you tell them that they can't do it themselves. They can't save themselves. They can't believe in their own power. They can't change their own hearts. They have to have the new birth of the Spirit. And since God alone can give that new birth, they have to go to Him in order to get it. You see, it's true when when you share the gospel with other people, some people are converted and they receive Christ and they believe immediately, but there are those people who don't. But there's that, and they, they walk away, but there, are, there is that middle category, which we don't often see, because maybe we don't know it exists. And that is the people who know what you're saying is true, but who still know that they don't love Jesus. You need to direct them to God for this gift of the Holy Spirit, because only He can give it. So yes, it is important that you understand this doctrine, but it doesn't mean you have to know it to experience it. We need to understand that distinction. Now, Jesus told Nicodemus that he should have already known about this doctrine. It's clearly taught in the Old Testament. Not as clearly as it is in the New Testament, but it's certainly there. This is what the Lord was talking about when he commanded his, his own people to circumcise their hearts, to change their attitude towards him, to love Him and to trust Him and to obey Him. He told those people who were stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart, who were, for the most part, His own people. It was certainly true of the people in the world, but the people in, in the church at that time as well, the vast majority of them, were unconverted people. He said, stop being stubborn. Stop stiffening your neck. Stop hardening your heart against me. Circumcise your heart. Listen to me. Obey me. Love me, He says. Moses writes in Deuteronomy 10, verses 14 through 16, Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the highest heavens, the earth and all that is in it. Yet on your fathers did the Lord set his affection to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, even you above all peoples, as it is this day. So circumcise your heart and stiffen your neck no longer. God has bestowed a great mercy on you, so love Him and obey Him. Now, think about this for a minute. 
Does the fact that God commands this and he commands you to circumcise your heart and not to stiffen your neck, does that mean you can do it? That you don't need the Spirit's work to do this? That's not what he's saying. We've already seen what Jesus said. Only God can do this work, which is why God in the Old Testament also promised that he would give what he commanded. In Deuteronomy 30, verses 5 through 6, the Lord your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. And he will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. Moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul so that you may live. Is this something that they could do? No, it's not something they could do. Only God could do it. And basically, he's preaching the gospel to them right here saying that he was going to do it. Not only was he going to do it, but he was going to send the basis upon which it could be done. That is, he was going to send his son into the world to live and to die so that he might send his spirit. And by the way, it doesn't just happen after Jesus comes. On the basis of what Jesus did, he was applying it even in the Old Testament. But I do believe in this passage, he was looking forward to the new. Well, why does God command you to do this when he alone can actually do it? Well, you've got to see it's for the same reason that he commands you in any other area to do things that you're not able to do. You know that God commands you to be perfect. He commands everyone in the world to be perfect. Not only those who are converted, but those who are outside of the church, knowing that you can't be perfect apart from his grace and mercy in Jesus Christ. And even with it, I mean, you can be positionally perfect, but not practically perfect. But why does he command perfection? when you're not able to give him perfection because that's your responsibility. You realize God requires perfection? That's the standard. Jesus' image, which is perfect. Now, how do we know that's true? Well, because we know God never sends anyone to hell who doesn't deserve to be in hell, right? But how many sins does it take to send you there? It just takes one, which means that if you're going to go to heaven, you can't even have one. You have to be perfect. But how can God expect you to be perfect when you're not able to be perfect? Well, again, here's something that's hard to swallow. It's because it's your own fault that you're not perfect. Well, I thought it was Adam's fault that I wasn't perfect. I thought it was because he sinned in the garden. Why does God hold me accountable for that sin? Well, remember, Adam was your representative. And when he sinned, God holds you accountable for that particular sin because he was your representative. Yes, he's the one who made you imperfect, but he was representing you. And so that sin is your sin. And that is why you cannot obey God perfectly. By the way, I know many people get up in arms at this and say, it's not fair, God, it's not fair that you would hold me responsible for something that this man did. And yet, we don't complain when we look at what Jesus Christ did how he obeyed perfectly and how he died and how God gives that to us freely because he represented us. We don't complain when he gives us the righteousness that gets us into heaven and yet we didn't obey and we didn't pay for those sins. That's not fair, God. You shouldn't give me what Jesus did. But he can because of representation. So if you object to the fact that it's your fault, you're not perfect, you're also going to have to object that it's Christ's fault that you're perfect and you're not going to object to that. But now getting back to Nicodemus, again, he should have known that this was the Spirit's work, not only because of what God said in the Old Testament about circumcision of the heart and the promise that he would one day do it, but also because of this great illustration in the Old Testament we have of the work of regeneration and God's promise in Ezekiel. And I thought I would read this just because it's so uh, when I use the term graphic, I mean it's, it's graphic in the sense that it's just so clearly portrayed for us in Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. This is the vision of the valley of dry bones. Ezekiel writes, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. He caused me to pass among them round about, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and lo, they were very dry. He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? 
And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Again he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you that you may come to life. I will put sinews on you and make flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin and put breath in you that you may come alive and you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied there was a noise and behold a rattling and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked and behold sinews were on them and flesh grew and skin covered them but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son, O man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may come to life. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they came to life and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is perished. We are completely cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, my people. And I will bring you into the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, my people. I will put my spirit within you. And you will come to life, and I will place you on your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it, declares the Lord. Now, Ezekiel, the context, Judah was in exile. They were cut off from the land of Israel. God was promising that, you know, they were dead as far as they were concerned. But God was promising he was going to bring them back into the land, and he was going to renew them and make them live again. By his Holy Spirit, they weren't actually dead bones on the ground. They were still physically alive. But he was saying that he was going to renew them spiritually. They were spiritually dead. But he was going to make them alive. By the way, did Nicodemus know about Ezekiel? Of course he did. Jesus said, are you the teacher of Israel and don't understand these things? Nicodemus, you should have known. It's clearly taught in the Old Testament. What I am saying to you is nothing new. But second, the new birth is even more clearly taught in the New Testament and by one who has come down from heaven itself. Now, why else should Nicodemus have believed that what Jesus was saying was true? Well, it's because Jesus just told him it was. He continues, that is, Jesus continues in verse 11, Truly, truly, I say to you, Nicodemus, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen. And you do not accept our testimony. You don't believe me, Nicodemus. But now notice, Jesus uses the plural here, which is kind of interesting. Why is Jesus using the plural? Who is the we he's referring to? Well, maybe he was speaking about his father. The father testifies through me and I testify. You should listen to us, Nicodemus. Or maybe he's speaking about the spirit who speaks through the word. Or maybe he's speaking about what takes everything into account, the scripture and himself. The scripture testifies to what Jesus was just teaching him, as we've just seen from the Old Testament. But so does Jesus. Nicodemus, you have two witnesses, and you only need two to establish anything. You have the testimony of the Old Testament scriptures, which you should have listened to, and you have my testimony, Nicodemus, to establish the truth. And yet, he says, you do not receive our testimony. Still don't believe. What more could Jesus have done to explain it? Look at verse 12. Basically, he couldn't have done anything more. He says, if I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Now, Jesus doesn't mean by this that the teaching of the Spirit's breathing life, the teaching of the new birth is some kind of an earthly teaching and not a heavenly one. But what he's saying is that if Nicodemus doesn't understand it in the way that Jesus just explained it, that is using earthly images to illustrate it, being born of water and of the Spirit and the blowing of the wind, if Nicodemus still didn't get it, how could he understand if Jesus explained it more pointedly using heavenly language? Matthew Henry, commenting on this verse, writes this, 
If I have told them earthly things, that is, have told them the great things of God in similitudes taken from earthly things to make them the more easy and intelligible as that of the new birth and the wind, if I have thus accommodated myself to your capacities and lisped to you in your own language and cannot make you to understand my doctrine, what would you do if I should accommodate myself to the nature of the things and speak with the tongue of angels and language which mortals cannot utter? If such familiar expressions be stumbling blocks, what would abstract ideas be and spiritual things painted proper? In other words, Jesus made it as clear as he could have possibly made it. And if Jesus couldn't do this, who, who else could? You know, the problem wasn't with Jesus' explanation. The problem was with Nicodemus because Jesus is the perfect teacher. I want you to notice in verse 13 what Jesus says. No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Well, why would anybody want to ascend into heaven? Well, for a couple of different reasons. In the Old Testament, you know, it's, it said, who's going to come into heaven to bring the Messiah down? Who's going to go up into heaven to bring God's truth down to us? Well, that's what was needed, you see. And that's exactly what God provided the only one who actually has gone to heaven because he was already there in heaven and came down to reveal God's truth to us is the Lord Jesus Christ. As far as everybody else is concerned, their trips to heaven have been one-way trips. You don't go up and down. Even those prophets who stood in the holy council chambers of God, such as Isaiah, really only did so by way of vision. And I'm not sure that, entirely sure that they were actually caught up in heaven, although Paul was on one occasion. But nothing like this. There is only one who was in heaven, one who is eternal with the Father and the Spirit, who came down from heaven, who was made incarnate in the womb of the Virgin, who became a man, who came to teach us these very things. Remember what John wrote earlier in this gospel? And the Word became flesh and he dwelt among us. And why did he do this? Verse 18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. That is, he has revealed him to us. He has revealed him and his will to us. By the way, I thought it was interesting that one of the alternate readings in, in the original language, which is reflected in the King James, those of you who have been following along notice there was a certain section that was missing, uh, puts this, this idea of Jesus coming down in an even more striking way because this is how verse 13 reads in the King James. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, so far the same, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven, Basically, what Jesus is saying there is, I'm, I'm standing before you, Nicodemus, but I'm also in heaven at the same time. Well, how can that be? We need to understand that Jesus is God and man. And though as man he may be on earth as God, he was still very much in heaven. By the way, when Jesus cries out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's not saying the Father left him or there's a rift in the Godhead. But the man, Christ Jesus, was separated from that fellowship with his Father because he was bearing your sins. He wasn't separated and there wasn't a rift in heaven. Uh, the, the divine uh, Son of God was not separated from the Father, but the human Christ was. So even though he's on earth, he's still very much in heaven. Jesus is a teacher sent from God, as Nicodemus said. We know that you've come from God. He is the Messiah, as we saw that Nicodemus very likely already believed. What Jesus was teaching Nicodemus agreed perfectly with the Old Testament scriptures. Jesus himself has the ability to explain God's truth and was explaining those same things to Nicodemus in the simplest way. By the way, have you ever noticed when Jesus is teaching throughout scripture how he's always drawing from you know, uh, the, the things that he sees around him, the things in the culture, the tangible things, things you can see and touch and experience to explain uh, spiritual truth. Jesus 
has the ability to explain hard things in the simplest way. And Jesus is the only one who has ever come down from heaven to explain these things to us. Most importantly, to show us the only way to enter into his kingdom. So in closing, let me ask you these questions. Is that what you believe regarding Jesus? And if you do believe these things, what are you doing about it? Do you know that Jesus wrote a book for you? It's called the Bible, right? Now, he didn't personally write it. He used other authors, but it was his spirit writing down his word. Jesus is called the word of God. He's not called the word of God for no reason. And all of it is his word, the Old Testament as well as the New. Jesus came down from heaven to reveal all this truth to you. You have a treasure beyond measure in your hands. The question is, are you reading it? Not just the New Testament, but the Old Testament as well. Secondly, do you understand what he says there? Or are you like Nicodemus? You don't quite understand. Well, how can these things be? Do you understand the new birth? You know, again, Nicodemus knew a lot of things, didn't he? He was the teacher of Israel. He was an expert in the Old Testament, and yet he missed this most basic teaching, how to enter into God's kingdom. There are a lot of people today professing Christians, pastors of churches, college and seminary professors who have made it their life's work to study the Bible, and yet they still miss this point. I mean, a lot of them miss the kingdom of heaven altogether because there's a lot of people who profess Christ in many different walks, as it were, who still don't even know Jesus Christ. So do you see it and do you understand it? Do you believe it? Do you believe that this is the only way that you can enter into the kingdom of heaven through the new birth? Do you understand that that is not a decision that you make? We're not, we don't believe in decisional Christianity in the sense that anybody can decide at any time to be a Christian. Because if you believe that, you're going to take that prayer that you can supposedly pray and get into the kingdom, put it in your back pocket and wait until your death, the day of your death, and then hopefully pull it out and pray and get in under the wire. It doesn't work that way. Only the Spirit of God can give it to you by breathing life into you. He is as sovereign as it is as the wind. Now, understanding this and believing this, have you experienced this new birth? Has your life been transformed from the inside out? Have you given yourself to Jesus? You know, we were down in San Diego this past Lord's Day. You know that very well because Bob Needham was up here. We were down celebrating my mother's 90th. But we went to, uh, to church with her, to a church called Pacific Hope, which we, we very much appreciated. And there, the pastor said something which was very stark but yet very true he said this if you're undecided still between Jesus and the world if you're riding the fence he says you're not a Christian you're not a Christian he's right that's exactly what Jesus said I mean what did Jesus mean when he said to the Laodiceans I'd rather that you be hot or cold but if you're lukewarm I'm going to vomit you out of the mouth. Who is a lukewarm person but somebody who's riding the fence? If you haven't committed your life to Jesus Christ, you haven't experienced the new birth. Jesus says you need to be born again. And by the way, Jesus also said unless you're born again, you can't even see the kingdom of heaven. Now Jesus doesn't mean by that you can't understand what it is and you, you can't believe that it exists. I mean, the devils believe it. They're not converted. It's certainly, you can understand it and believe it's true without being born again. But you can't see it without the new birth. Because in order to see it, you need faith. And you not only need faith to believe that it is, but you also need the illumination of the Holy Spirit to make what you see so desirable so wonderful, so beautiful that you're willing to give up everything in order to enter into that kingdom. If you see the kingdom of heaven in this way, it draws your heart out to him to leave the world behind. It makes you willing to pay everything, to give up everything 
in order that you might enter it. Jesus says this in Matthew 13, verses 44 through 46. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And, over, and from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. You see, this is how you need to see the kingdom of heaven if you're going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. But this is exactly what Jesus said. Unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. You'll never see it in this way. You will never pay the price that you need to pay in order to enter it. You will still hold on to the world. You won't let go of it in order to, to enter the kingdom. You just won't be willing to pay the price. And so the question that this text asks you this morning is, have you seen the kingdom of heaven in this way? If you haven't, then you need to be born again by the Spirit of God. You need to be praying that God would show mercy to you, send His Spirit to open your eyes. But if the Lord has opened your eyes, what does this tell you? What are you doing with your life? Are you pressing forward the way that the Lord calls you to? Again, he's very pointed about how one enters the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 14, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Few who find it. The vast majority of people who have heard the gospel are going to perish under the gospel. Only a few find this path. Now, if you found this path, what kind of effort do you need to make in entering into the kingdom of heaven? Jesus says you need to make the greatest effort. Luke 13, verses, verse 24. He says, strive to enter through the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Remember on one occasion, Jesus said, you have to be like a violent man trying to take a city. That's the kind of effort you need to make to enter into the kingdom of heaven. So if the Spirit of God opens your eyes to see the value of it, you're willing to break down the doors of that kingdom as it were to enter. But you see, there aren't any doors holding you out. The only thing that's stopping you is this world and your flesh, which is tempted and energized by the devil. That's what's stopping you and that's what you need to assault if you're going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. But if you see the value of the kingdom because the Spirit of God has opened your eyes, that's exactly what you're going to do. And so is that what you're doing? Are you fighting against those sins? Are you killing them? You have to put them to death. Are you putting them off and putting on the Lord Jesus Christ? In other words, are you repenting of your sins and living the life Jesus calls you to live? Are you reading the Bible to see what he actually says? And, and so you can do it so that you can please and honor the one that you love more than anyone else. I mean, if you really do love the Lord more than, you know, any, anyone, anything else with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, aren't you going to read the Bible and see what the one whom you love says? so you can do it. That's consistent with the new birth and with seeing the kingdom and striving to enter into the kingdom. Do we ever fall lax and fall into some kind of a spiritual stupor? Of course, we do, but when we see that we do, we need to repent and get back up and continue to strive forward. And by the way, if you are a believer, you're not only going to be doing this yourself, but you're also going to be doing what you can to help others find that narrow path and strive to enter it as well. You're going to be sharing the gospel with them. This is a biblical definition of what it means to be a Christian. This is what the one who came down from heaven actually told us. It's not a matter of man's opinion. It's a matter of Christ's opinion. He's God in human flesh. He is the Word of God. He knows what's right and what's wrong. You need to listen to him. This is what he says you must do if you are to enter into the kingdom of heaven. So may the Lord grant to each of us here this morning that we would read his word, that we would understand his word, 
that we would believe it and act upon it, do what it says, and so enter into that kingdom. Again, may the Lord um, help each one of us. Let's uh, bow for a moment of prayer and ask for God's grace.